I'm Robert Cohen. Our subject, who is the American connection? With me are Pat Saunders and Jerry Laveroni. Pat and Jerry joined the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department in the late 1960s. They were idealistic young men. They respected the concept of law and order. They, I don't know, perhaps even worshipped individuals like J. Edgar Hoover, like many young Americans did at the time. And they wanted to fight for what they thought was justice and law in America. Well, they subsequently joined the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs in 1971. Two years after they joined it, then-President Nixon merged this bureau with sections of the U.S. Customs and Treasury Departments to form the well-funded uh, Department of is it, uh, no, Drug Enforcement Agency. Mm -hmm. Although initially enthusiastic about their work as undercover narcotics agents, after several years of dramatic investigations, both Pat and Jerry became disillusioned with the agency <coughs> and subsequently resigned in January 1974. They are presently collaborating on a book entitled The Power Politics of Drug Enforcement. Pat, what led you to go into law enforcement in the first place? I mean, why did you do it? Well, for me, it was somewhat of a coincidence. Uh, I was looking for a job at the time. I had uh, graduated from college and my wife was pregnant and I needed a job. And I've always believed that law enforcement or a federal agency would be an honorable profession. And at least I hoped that it would be. And uh, I went into the sheriff's office and subsequently went into the Federal Bureau of Narcotics uh, looking for a career, looking for a job that I could be proud of, my family could be proud of, and something that I could feel good about. And uh, it's only after maybe a year or two that I became disillusioned and uh, be began seeing some of this corruption. Well, and, let's, uh, before we get into uh -huh, the corruption, okay. uh, when you, uh, you went to college here in California. Right, Long Beach State University. Uh, what did you take there? A psychology. Uh, at that time, did you, uh, <clears throat> did you have a personal thing about anti-narcotics or anything of the kind, or how did you get into that particularly? No, I was, actually I was quite naive about narcotics, in regards to narcotics. I never used narcotics and uh, knew very little about it. I was, as most people my age or most people in America, I was programmed as I came through the elementary schools and the high schools to believe of certain things. And uh, I just, all I knew was heroin as far as narcotics and they, I was bad and that we had to get that out of the street and uh, things like that. But I was somewhat naive. In your studies in psychology, uh, had that led you in any way to be interested, let's say, in why people would do something like take narcotics? Uh, to a certain extent, but I hadn't uh, thought about it extensively and I was just more or less looking for a profession and like I said before something I could be proud of and something to make a living for my family and I knew very little about it until I got into it and went to Washington in, in the training school. Uh, Jerry, what about yourself? Did you have a similar background or somewhat different? Well, I went to, uh, I went to the University of uh, California, Northridge and graduated from there in 1968. I'd always had a an in-depth interest in law enforcement from the time that I was, well, I can think back to a letter that I wrote to uh, J. Edgar Hoover when I was in the ninth grade. I inquired about the existence and information pertaining and relating to uh, the mafia. When you were in the ninth grade, you asked the head of the FBI about the mafia. Right, and I remember the reply I got back, and I had read everything I could get my hands on in the library on the mafia, and uh, the reply I got back was, it was really amazing. It was a one-paragraph letter with J. Edgar Hoover's signature, and it, in substance it stated, there is no such organization that I have knowledge of or information on in the United States. And that really, you know, that really astounded me. Now, wait. Now, so if, when you were in the ninth grade, the head of the FBI wrote you a letter and said there is no such thing as the mafia or organized crime in the United States? That's correct. Uh, but sen is this what encouraged you to then go into law enforcement? It was just... Uh, I don't think I really had a specific goal to enter into law enforcement. I just had a uh, deep-seated interest uh, in organized crime and how it could be so ongoing and so large and consistently 
perpetuating its, its bigness and not, nothing happening to it. And I guess it was sort of in the back of my mind, uh, maybe someday to enter, uh, enter into some sort of endeavor to find out more about organized crime or do something about it, but it wasn't really that specific uh, until my later years in college. And uh, by my senior year in college, uh, I started really contemplating entering law enforcement. First, I thought the FBI. First, I thought the FBI, and then I thought, no, I'd like to learn learn the street. So I entered the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, and uh, I was with them for about three years. But I was in a very sophisticated uh, area. It was very confined. It was West Hollywood mm -hmm. here in Los Angeles. It was about one or two square miles. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I found that there was a lot of organized hoods, you know, in, within in that West area. In West Los Angeles. In West Los Angeles. And uh, I just made it my personal, personal endeavor to uh, investigate these guys on my own. We had uh, the same old story that I found in the, in, the, in the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. There was a lot of detectives sitting there in West Hollywood, just sitting. And I was in a black and white in uniform, and I was out doing detective work just on my own time. And even after I got off duty, I tailed guys, rapped to guys, building up my own dossier and my own feeling on a certain particular individual, which at a later date as a federal agent proved to my benefit. So, so that uh, actually your motivations are quite different that led you into the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency. Uh, in Pat's case, essentially you were looking for a respectable profession, something that you could be proud of and that right. would benefit you and your family. And in Jerry's case, you had had a childhood fascination with my childhood things. fascination was, well, I guess, is really contradictory to my profession. I was more fascinated with the mafia than I was with police force or police work. But the, the, you still thought, I mean, this still was something, when you were on the police force, even though you were a street policeman, at least a motor, in, a, in an automobile, you still took it upon yourself to do investigative and detective work, which is not necessarily your assignment. Right. I remember one specific incident. Uh, in law enforcement, you have... Uh, degrees of jealousy. If you cross over into somebody else's line of endeavor or supposed responsibility and you're turning up information that he should have turned up a long time ago, you get your hand slapped. And I remember I developed a, a heck of a package on a, uh, on a murder case involving organized crime just on my own. And I put it all together and I started requesting teletype information from Sacramento pertaining to, to two or three organized guys that were in the West Hollywood Beverly Hills area. Well, as soon as this information came back, my captain pulled me in the office and told me, you know, that's not your line mm -hmm. of, and you know, that's not your assignment. And you do that again, you're going to get 10 days off. Well, I said, well, I'm a policeman. I don't understand. I said, any information I get, I'll give to the detectives. And the detectives, uh, they weren't that jealous. They were happy that I did it because they knew that I'd have to give it to them for them to pursue. They get the credit for it eventually. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, now, both of you, though, about the same time, left the Sheriff's Department and went into the Drug Enforcement Agency, to what eventually became the Drug Enforcement Agency. That's correct. correct. And why did you do that, <clears throat> Pat? Why did I leave uh, the Sheriff's Office? Yes. I didn't personally like the idea of uh, wearing a uniform and uh, working in the jail. I had to work in the jail for the first year, and I just personally didn't like working in the jail, and I didn't like working... Uh, with a uniform on, and uh, federal narcotics work sounded to me uh, somewhat fascinating. Glamorous? And glamorous is a good term Were for it. Were you recruited for it? Did they give you a pep talk? No, I went down to their office, and then they gave me the pep talk when I got to the office. And uh, I thought it, it sounded glamorous, a chance to wear regular clothes, to work undercover, and uh, travel, and that sort of thing. And it, it sounded good to me, and I decided to make the move. What about you, Jerry? Well, I remember one night while I was, uh, I just made it a, a narcotics arrest. In my particular area, not only organized crime, but narcotics was uh, quite prevalent on the Sunset Strip area. And it seemed to me that my basic arrests were all narcotics. And at this particular evening, I brought in a couple of guys for possession of heroin. And there was two federal narcotics agents uh, there at the time. And uh, the way they were dressed, uh, their long hair, uh, their beard, and the way they carried themselves uh, kind of carried a mystique for me. So I just started rapping with the guys and uh, come to find out that I was qualified to, uh, to apply for a position at uh, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. So they convinced me to, uh, 
uh, go down to the bureau and, uh, and apply. We'd come to find out the two guys that I was rapping with were two of the worst agents I've ever seen in my life. I was uh, sent from uh, Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in uh, January of 1970 to the training school in Washington. And we spent three months uh, drug identification, search and seizure, uh, self-defense, and that sort of thing. Uh, learning about the different laws and the different techniques that we'd use. We were, we were sent back out to our region. And uh, it was quite extensive training. And uh, after that time, after I'd come back to Los Angeles, I was sent back again for uh, two weeks uh, in wiretapping and uh, break-ins. You were trained in wiretapping and break-ins? Uh, wiretapping, lockpicking, break-ins. Was it in a CIA conducted school? Uh, there was CIA personnel there by the telephone company, uh, which is very closely aligned with federal law enforcement, were involved in training us and giving us equipment and giving us certain manuals to study and giving us certain techniques. Well, let me just interject for a moment here. Based on the present day situation where there's all these accusations about the CIA and other government agencies performing criminal acts and uh, yeah. with the President of the United States saying that, you know, the, no crime should be committed, and the Attorney General Levy and so on saying this. At that time, were you ever given any advice or training that, let's say, telephone tapping or breaking and entering could only be done, let's say, with a court order, or were you just trained to do it? We were just trained uh, how to break and enter, how to pick locks and wiretap, and uh, there was no explanation as far as, well, we do it in this certain instance and not this one. It was just understood that law enforcement personnel were somewhat above the law in certain areas and that uh, you just utilize these skills in your region when you were reassigned and uh, it was just taken for granted because the stories you we'd heard from the older agents and the more experienced agents that when you got back to your region you did what you wanted to do anyway and uh, these skills would be utilized back in your region we just took it for granted that the, you know that they wiretapped the police wiretap and later on I found out that was true the, the police and local law enforcement, police departments, wiretap, break into people's houses, and, and things like that. Things you, that when I got personal into knowledge the of this, you 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 learn these things when when you got into the field. Sure. That this actually goes on. Sure. Uh, what aspect that, that were you trained? Uh, let's say in the question of organized crime, since you were being trained for drug enforcement, uh, was any of the training about how drugs are brought into the United States, how they're wholesaled, how they're retailed, things of this kind? Well. Somewhat, but the emphasis was on the, and this is also in my opinion and the way we were trained, the emphasis was on the minority group member, the person that was using drugs and not the source of supply and the uh, people that were bringing the drugs into our country. And I think that's quite unfortunate, but that's the, <coughs> the training that we received. Now, when Go you after the buyer, the small, the mule, the small person, instead of the source of supply. When you say the minority group member, I mean, can you get specific about that? how you were trained. Was this point out where you told that blacks are dope addicts or Chicanos are dope addicts? Just w what form did this take? Well, it was pointed out, in my opinion, again, and the feelings that I got when I was in training, that uh, the Bureau was a, a racist and a sexist organization. And uh, there's a lot of uh, references to uh, uh, blacks and Chicanos in kind of degrading fashion. And it was said, well, you know, everybody knows that blacks use drugs and things like that. And uh, that was sort of the feeling that everyone got, that blacks use drugs. So we'd go after blacks and Chicanos and minority members, and that whites you know, usually didn't use drugs sort of thing. Were there any uh, minority people being trained with you, other agents? Blacks, Chicanos? I don't believe we had any blacks or Chicanos in my class, no. I see. So essentially, uh, I know later, after about a year after I was in the bureau, there was a, a, a program where they try to recruit minority members because they were required to have a certain amount of uh, minority members in federal law enforcement. And I recall there was a drive in that direction, but at the time I was in, I don't recall any blacks or uh, Chicanos or any other minority members in my class. And, and, and discussions and the attitude of the other people were sort of uh, to downgrade and uh, kind of a prejudiced attitude, prejudicial attitude towards these people. Uh, Jerry? Yeah, I'd like to make a comment on that and clarification in my point of view on, on, the, on the training school in regard to specific groups uh, or types of people who uh, 
endeavored to smuggle or sale, uh, sell uh, major quantities of narcotics. It was primarily set up by the administration, uh, by the intelligence unit and by the enforcement unit who call the shots for the agents in the field and for the, the regional offices uh, within the field. And it was a systems analysis of how the narcotics comes in, who brings it in, and who are the biggest prime movers you know, of narcotics. Now, the systems uh, set up work to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, and as far as the minority groups are concerned, uh, I never got the impression that the Bureau was saying that blacks specifically, let's do them because they deal in dope, Mexican specifically. It was just a fact based on research in the systems it set up that the Cubans were major uh, procurers of major quantities uh, of heroin of heroin and cocaine mm -hmm. importation into the United States. The black community primarily was a recipient of this distribution on the East Coast. The Italians naturally are interested in narcotics because it's one of the quickest criminal turnovers, you know, in crime, money per se, money-wise. Yeah. And the Corsicans, who are the, uh, the people who have the finesse to uh, prepare uh, the importation or the smuggling of narcotics into the United States. The South Americans, that's where it's at. That's where the narcotics are, uh, are picked up moved into the United States. So they set these systems up. You had the Cubans, the Mexicans, the South Americans, the Italians, and the Corsicans. Okay, within each minority community, you're going to have a family, uh, for the sake of uh, explanation, like, say, La Cosa Nostra. You mean a, a criminal association? Criminal association within a certain minority group. Uh, in the Cubans, you have a, a certain group that uh, can obtain certain amount of quantities of cocaine and you have intelligence information on this one family, but there's many other families that are doing the same darn thing, but you only have one informant. I see. An informant in federal law enforcement is really the prime mover in most of your investigations. I'd say 75 to 80 percent of your investigations within the federal structure uh, is conducted through informants because these cats get bred big money for their services. So the government is, in fact, buying information oh, yeah. uh, about uh, uh, drug, uh, narcotics traffic. But in your training, you, do, you did get a system search. I was really, uh, I went to the Sheriff's Academy, and I was there for 22 weeks. When I, walked out, when I walked out the door of the Sheriff's Academy, I knew the street. I knew the, the laws of the state of California and of the county of Los Angeles. When I walked out of the Academy of uh, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, I was confused because I only had 12 weeks of federal law and federal enforcement and federal procedures. And I just didn't feel as though I was fully equipped uh, as an agent to go out and enforce those laws of the federal government. If I would have been given, uh, if I hadn't been a police officer and to pat myself on the back a good one, I probably would have been lost like a lot of agents I have seen later come out of the academy ex-insurance salesmen, uh, ex-school teachers. They got a badge, they got credentials, they got a gun, and they think they got a big S on their chest and the doors are going to open up and all the <laughs> criminals are going to walk in. Well, I remember when I came back from Washington, I was assigned to, uh, I graduated number one in my class and I was giving a given uh, geographical uh, choice of assignment. Uh, I chose Los Angeles because I felt as though that I knew the Los Angeles area as a resident and as a deputy sheriff. I came back to LA, uh, which is the regional office for California, which uh, has numerous districts. There's San Francisco district office, you have the San Diego district office, you have the Las Vegas district office, and then you have the border city, San Ysidro, and uh, I can't think of the, what was the other one? San Ysidro. Calexico? Calexico yeah. was another office. You get back to the office and you're, you're really, you really you want to be a hard charger. You're a Fed now and you figure you're, you're big time and it's time to get the big people, the people that you couldn't get that were, uh, when I say get now, that's, that's an in-house term mm -hmm. of a federal agent. It's not, uh, at least my feeling was, don't go out and get anybody just for the sake of getting somebody. But you were just, you know, you're chopping at the bit 
to hit well, the street. You, while you had been in the sheriff's department, you had dealt with narcotics, uh, let's say small dealers and, and users. Right, the, the person who injects the, the heroin in the shooting galleries, the, the guy who You might has say the a, victims in some ways. Right, the victims of, uh, say, primarily users and uh, possessors. And of, now uh, that you're a federal agent with federal academy training, you want to go out and really try to stop the narcotics importers, wanna, traffickers, and so on. Yeah, you want to get to the source of supply, but before you got out onto the street, uh, the in-house fighting uh, of political factions that existed within the Los Angeles regional office was almost astounding, but was pushed aside in my mind at the time, which would later open at a gradual... Now, wait, uh, now wait, you, wait. You came back from Washington. Right. You asked to be stationed here in Los Angeles, right. and you were. What happened? Well... Let's have, I mean, you know, I understand the abstract terms of political infighting, but how did this manifest itself to you, and your, what did you see and hear? It was just like uh, the office was divided into two parts. Uh, there was the upstairs group and the downstairs group, and there was about 15 or 16 agents that always seemed to have the best informants and always seemed to have the, the best cases. And there was the other group who always seemed to have all the paperwork and they too engaged in some political alliance within the, within the regional office. There were certain administrators that had certain agents that they favored, and there was the other administrator who had certain agents that he favored. See, the Los Angeles office divided up in two divisions, Division I, Division II, which have a head who is now called an administrator, Administrator I over Division I, Administrator II. And they were com competing with one another? Exactly, because it's a stat game in, uh, in federal narcotics. The more cases you make, or the more seizures you make, or the more overtures to an investigation that you make, the better appropriations the following year from Congress will be forthcoming to that agency. But I, you know, I just kind of saw these things on the periphery. When, when I hit the street, uh, I had to go out and get myself some informants. How'd you do that? Well, as a police officer, I had made contacts with guys that I knew that were involved in uh, the criminal underworld. So I had built various uh, investigative packages on guys that I thought that I could twist. Well, you know, you were going to go out and extort information from people because you thought you had evidence that could be used against them for criminal proceedings. I think extort's a bad word. Well, squeeze it out of them. <laughs> well, you have to understand an informant wants to be an informant because he wants to be an informant. And a lot of guys, uh, after a certain while, time on the other side of the street as a criminal, they get tired. And they want to have the protection of law enforcement, and they'll come to you with the information. Or if you're contacted, you have to contact a guy and kind of push him into it. And once they realize that there's big money to be made as an informant, oh, in other words, you would go to someone uh, against whom you felt you had some information, or you knew that they were involved in criminal activity, right? And you would offer them money if they would give you information? Not, not initially. What you do, like this, I had a very, uh, very strong and worthwhile organized crime informant who eventually uh, could overturn, I'd say, 50 or 60 major organized crime uh, people in La Cosa Nostra. Now, what I did with this man is I knew him for five years. I knew everything he did, criminally and otherwise, and I placed a lot of value on him whereas a lot of other law enforcement agencies didn't because they failed to know the individual. So I only approached this man when I knew both sides of the question, the yes and no, why he would become a snitch or why he wouldn't become a snitch. In this particular case, I didn't think he would because he was too strong of a, a man and too high of a member in La Cosa Nostra. But when I sat this man down and talked to him for four hours and told him everything I knew, after I was through, he just shook his head and said, what do you want me to do? Now, when you told him what you knew, you meant that you knew about his involvement in criminal activities. Right, but see, you don't come out and tell him, uh, even if you don't know for sure, you let him think you know for you sure. Imply that you imply the truth right. of the matter. And this guy had a couple of murders hanging over his head, which could never be proven, but I didn't let him think that. And uh, our relationship actually became quite friendly, which the Bureau kind of frowns on, which I think is a shortcoming of the Bureau. You, a lot of informants, uh, which is a different, uh, different ballgame altogether, but you have to approach them uh, 
as individuals and human beings because they have, a, they have an ego to be supported or problems to be reconciled or denied. Now, what about you, Pat? I, I find some of this a little humorous, talking about informers and criminals, because uh, personally I think some of the biggest criminals are uh, working for the Drug Enforcement Administration today. And uh, that's why I'm so happy that uh, these Senate hearings have started, and I guess we'll get into that later. Yeah. But as far as my training, uh, I was sent back to Los Angeles, as was Jerry, and I was placed in an enforcement group, which would handle surveillance and undercover buys and that sort of thing. After a short time, I kind of tired of that, the, the undercover thing, and I got into electronics work, and I was transferred into the intelligence unit and uh, began uh, working as an intelligence officer and working on wiretap investigations. And um, I think at that time, that's where uh, the disillusionment for me came in. When you were work doing wiretaps? Doing the wiretaps and uh, working in intelligence as far as seeing how the laws were uh, enforced and the corruption and the beatings of defendants and that sort of wait, thing. Wait, now let's take one thing at a time. Okay. Okay. You were working in wiretap and intelligence. Well, after I worked in enforcement, right. After you worked in enforcement. Right. Uh, when you, did you actually go into people's homes or businesses and put in electronic eavesdropping equipment? Now, most of the time we would work with a telephone company and we'd hook a, the wiretap on at the uh, telephone, wait. what they call B-boxes. In other words, you didn't have to enter the premises because the telephone company would let you use their facilities. They would give us the facilities and they would tell us the peers and appearances of the, the individual's telephone. Uh, so that, first of all, when you had been trained in this, you were trained by telephone company personnel, or at least partially. Partially, right. And then when you went out into the street to do your work, the telephone company provided you with the technical means so right. that you wouldn't have to enter the premises. Exactly. Uh, did, were these based on court orders or just done? They were based on uh, court orders in the United States. There were several uh, wiretaps conducted in Mexico that had no uh, court authorization and in Turkey. What, were you involved in these in Mexico or Turkey or did you know about them through fellow agents? Fellow agents and I was involved in uh, certain uh, electronic eavesdropping operations in Mexico. They were, they were authorized by the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. There was an operation, and one in particular, where we were sent to Mexico to uh, tap an individual's telephone in Mexico. And uh, usually you're uh, required to have uh, at least one federal police officer from Mexico accompany you and at least apprise him of what you're doing in their country. And uh, several occasions, and one in particular, uh, the federal drug enforcement agents went there and tapped the man's telephone, gathered the intelligence, and never apprised the, uh, the Mexicans uh, what they were doing in that country. Yeah, by unauthorized, I meant that you had not received the Me Mexican right. government authorization. Right, that's, from that's the Attorney General's that's office. That's correct. And uh, I know by discussions with other people that the FBI and the CIA do the same thing, not only in Mexico, but in other countries. We did, uh, I was on a case in Toronto, Canada back in uh, around the latter part of 73, uh, early part of 73, uh, name of the case, the file title on the case was Sherman Logan et al. And I'd been communicating with this guy via a ATF informant. Uh, what is that? Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, which is underneath the, uh, comes under the uh, control of the uh, U.S. Treasury Department. At any rate, I began talking to this guy over the phone and who supposedly had access to major quantities of cocaine in uh, the Toronto uh, area. So eventually, I convinced this guy that uh, I was going to come up and see him personally. Oh, wait, you were not speaking to him as a, you didn't say, I'm a federal agent. No, I was undercover. See, I, as I said, I was introduced to him over the phone by an informant who worked for ATF and came to me uh, through a friend of mine in ATF who advised me that this particular informant had narcotic information, and if I wished to pursue it, uh, I was welcome to utilize their informant. I see. And the informant's name was Jim. And at any rate, like I said, he introduced me to uh, the, uh, the defendant over the phone, and we had several conversations. Now, wait, uh, excuse me a moment. When you spoke to him over the phone, did, were you uh, telling him that you wanted to buy, acquire the drug, or what? Well, my cover basically was that I came off as an organized hood, 
and I was a renegade. In case he had any organized uh, crime affiliations himself, I was a renegade from the family. But yet I had a lot of money behind me, and I would just rap to this guy. You don't, you don't hit a guy right away with an order. You don't order up right away. You gotta, you gotta, gotta go into it gradually. Order for narcotics. Right. You don't say, I want five pounds of coke, guy's gonna freak. He says, the only guy who wants five pounds of coke on the first time I meet him is a man. Or the guy wants to rip me off. So you kind of ease into it. You just let the guy feel comfortable around you. And the advantage that you have as an undercover agent is you know both sides. He only knows one. He's a crook. I'm masquerading as a crook, but I, in effect, I'm a federal agent. So I kind of eased into the conversation with this guy. I, like I said, I spoke to him maybe three or four times over the phone. And uh, I had him convinced that uh, I was a member of La Cosa Nostra without ever saying it, because I spoke with a New York accent. I was really gruff on the phone. And, and I just told him, I said, hey, I'm coming to Buffalo, and I'm going to come and see you. And I said, you better be there. And he says, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. So when I get there, um, we go up to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police headquarters with a Buffalo, New York district supervisor. He was in charge of the uh, district office. And they advise, we advise them what our case is to date as they had been advised and appraised of the situation as it progressed anyway. So they don't say anything about any wiretaps at that time in the office. When we get to the holiday in there in Toronto, uh, they check us into a room and I'm, they're giving me an undercover room and the next room over is a surveillance room to monitor any activity that I might have within my room plus give me uh, federal protection in case there's, you know, anything funny t uh, transpires. So while I'm in my room, all of a sudden here comes all this electronic equipment. I mean, big tape recorders, uh, big uh, pen register machine, uh, monitoring devices, and the whole bit, and they're drilling holes through the, through the wall there in the, at the Holiday Inn and running wires through into my phone and back to the monitoring device uh, receiver in the adjoining room. And I, I asked the, the supervisor, who was a GS-14, I said, government employee, government federal employee. employee yeah. yeah, he's a f federal supervisor. And I said, what's going on? And he says, I'm going to tell you. Now, this is right in front of the uh, sergeant of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. This is an illegal act that we're doing, so keep your mouth shut. Uh, the sergeant here is supposed to get approval, but he's not. And he has the right to make that decision. And this was in Toronto? This is in Toronto. And he says, well, we're going to monitor every phone call that you get and then we're going to tap into every person that calls you. If this Sherman Logan guy introduces you to, you know, John Smith, then we're going to follow him, go to his residence, and then we're going to tap his phone. Now, so, was, it the, was it the Royal Canadian Mounted Police that was doing this or the U.S. Federal? The Royal Canadian Mounted Police was physically doing the tapping in our presence, and we were privy to all of it. But I was told to keep my mouth shut, so I, you know, I kept my mouth shut. Example of international cooperation. Right. So, at any rate, I met this guy undercover, and uh, naturally he brought on another guy, and they talked about another connection who was going to go overseas and get the dope and bring it into the Virgin Islands or the Bahamas and ultimately to me. Well, each guy that I met, his phone there in Toronto was subsequently tapped, and I heard the tape recordings that the Mounties had on each, each and every phone, so which is an example of, you know, international cooperation for illegal wiretapping. Now, just on, uh, turning to the question of philosophy of the thing, you've both been involved, therefore, in <coughs> surveillance wiretapping. Uh, you stated earlier that you felt that uh, most of the information that comes to drug enforcement agencies and to police agencies comes from paid informers. Correct. Uh, do you think that the value of the wiretap is sufficient uh, to counterbalance the danger to the public interest? of this type of, of information gathering? Well, I think that you know, obviously the 1968 On the Bus Act was created for a specific reason, and there are situations, uh, specifically uh, organized crime, which the On the Bus Act was primarily crea created for. There's, there's sometimes no other way to approach a criminal investigation. And when you get a wiretap, you've got to show that all avenues have failed an investigative approach. You can't get an undercover agent in to the criminal. You can't get an informant into the criminal. Uh, you're constantly and consistently burned on surveillance. 
However, the informant was in fact present when uh, this particular uh, criminal made a telephone call and narcotic uh, activity was, uh, had transpired within that conversation. And in fact, this informant is considered reliable and credible. Well, now, uh, when you say criminal, you mean the suspect. Suspect. Right. Right. And an informant has told you that this person is involved <coughs> in narcotics, and therefore you think that's sufficient grounds to ask for wiretap. Or no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Is that how it's is, done? No. What you got to do first is you gather intelligence information on a particular subject, and say this intelligence information has already been gathered maybe five years ago and nothing I has see. been done, and all of a sudden you come across some current information that uh, Joe Smith is, is really a major trafficker in narcotics. So then you intensify, say, an investigation. You start checking the guy out, where he goes, who he sees, the cars he drives, the money he's got. You do a whole criminal background on the guy. And he becomes a suspect because based on your criminal background check on this individual, you have some suspicion that he is, in fact, involved. And as you have to have pretty good information that a crime is being committed before you're going to do all this work, or do you go on fishing expeditions? You, you kind of go on, in narcotics, you kind of, because narcotics is a different breed of animal. As I was trying to explain, the, the, the cycle of information I just gave you is the approach to obtain a affidavit for a wiretap, a listening device, or a pen register on a particular suspect's what's a, phone. Uh, what's a pen register? Pen register is the, the instrument that records the, the, what, the incoming numbers and the outgoing numbers of the phone being tapped? Outgoing. Outgoing well, numbers. When you dial, in other words. Right. That the pin register will let you know who the tap uh, the tap e is calling but it won't give you their voice necessarily no but you have a voice you have a receiver will give you the voice I too see. but after you say like i said you all your avenues to uh, build a case on a particular suspect has become frustrated that's when you feel as though that uh, a wiretap is possibly necessary now I know in a lot, of, uh, a lot of cases, you can't get the wiretap, even after you uh, write a 27 or 30 page affidavit in support of your reasons why you should. And uh, I know there were some problems in the Justice Department that Will Wilson was signing all the affidavits uh, when in effect, actually John Mitchell, the Attorney General, was supposed to be in fact signing them, but he was off doing other things, uh, which is neither here nor there, I guess. <laughs> But uh, anyway, there are times when, um, at least in the federal agency that I know Pat will uh, attest to, is that you can't get the wiretap or that you know by the time you get the wiretap, uh, your information will be passe. So there's guys will go in and pre-tap a phone. Now, I'm not categorically saying that all federal agents illegally tap phones. That's not true. There's a very small percentage of federal agents, at least that I know of, that will tap phones. As far as local police agencies, I imagine they have the same problem as we did in the federal agencies. There's a small percentage of guys who will cross out of bounds to put a suspect behind bars. And that doesn't say that all law enforcement agencies or in police departments, you know, are corrupt. Well, you know, it's not true. But, but now, there's been a lot of talk about, and the point I'm trying to get at <coughs> really is, even if you think it's the only way to get information on what you believe to be criminal actions, mm -hmm. and you do get the authorization or unauthorized wiretap, mm -hmm. as has happened all too frequently in the past, mm -hmm. do you think that the information that is acquired through wiretapping is really that important to, the, to a conviction, not just to your conviction, but to a court conviction, since most of it is, not, is never usable in court? Well, yeah, I don't know where you get that information. Uh, if you have a righteous wiretap and it's been a, uh, and you have set up your probable cause within your support affidavit to obtain that wiretap, there's no reason why it can't be. It'll be challenged in a motion to suppress. Yeah. Uh, but uh, unless the affidavit is poorly written, it, uh, it the evidence could be suppressed. But in, in direct response to your question, what value is it? The value is if uh, the individual on the phone picks up the phone and he calls A and he says there's going to be a drop at uh, the corner of 8th and Main tonight at 9 o'clock. We're, we're knowing what the guy is doing before he does it and we'll set surveillance up prior to that delivery and we'll monitor the delivery and we'll, we'll get another suspect in our investigation, the guy who picks it up and maybe also the guy, the source of supply is calling the guy that we have his, his phone tap and says, hey John, this is Bill in South America stuff will be up in seven days 
Now we're, we're identifying where the source is coming from, and we know that who's receiving it. And then when the guy says, then he gets, makes another phone call or an incoming phone okay, call. Okay, well, the question is, though, that uh, the, his voice over the phone, the actual tape recording of someone saying, I'm going to pick something up, unless he says, I'm going to pick up the cocaine or the heroin, right? In other words, it, this is a whole system of inferences that you have made based on observations of the guy that you know what he means when he says at 9 o'clock tonight, you know, there will be a drop. Right. In other words, he made what he is specifically saying. You can't go into court, play it to a jury, and they'll convict based on him saying oh, that. Yes, oh, yes, you can. You can. They'll take, they'll take me on Bo Dyer on my expertise on what he said. I see. How many times have you heard that conversation? Based on your experience uh, in narcotic enforcement, what in effect does this conversation mean to you? We'll use code words. On right. Time. They'll use a code. Uh -huh. And if. Uh, so let's, let's just to, to summarize, you think that wiretapping, even though it doesn't constitute the bulk of means of acquiring information about drug uh, traffic, is a valuable tool. It's a lazy investigator's tool, really. I mean, I would prefer to try to break it without a wiretap. To me, it's more of a challenge. I believe in playing by the rules. And to me, if the crook is smarter than I am, by God, he goes free. I'll try to get him next time. I would just rather try to do it on the street level, on my own intelligence, my own initiative, my own informant. And I think it is, in effect, uh, a tremendous violation of civil rights to tap a man's phone. It seems like it's, you know, they've passed a law and said it's legal, but like uh, some laws, it's been stretched and stretched mm -hmm. and stretched. Well, now, the, the interesting thing is, of course, that you are very, very knowledgeable in this field. You've done it. You've practiced it in law enforcement and as a federal agent and also as a sheriff. And both of you have gotten involved in very notorious cases, some of the biggest cases that have taken place. Pat, could you, could you tell us about some of those? Well, one, of the case that, uh, one case that comes to mind to me especially is the, uh, my partner and I were sent uh, from the intelligence unit to uh, New Jersey to uh, debug the home and offices of Robert Vesco. Who uh, ordered you to do this? The uh, assistant regional director, or the, the deputy regional director, actually. Here in, in Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. Right. Now, one of the administrators. That is say, the, the, uh, the uh, representative uh, uh, officer of the Drug Enforcement Agency right. ordered you and your partner to right. go to New Jersey. Right. Then he, did he tell you, you are to go to New Jersey and to look for surveillance devices on Mr. Vesco's premises, or what? Well, he told my senior partner uh, to do that. My senior partner told me that we were going to New York and New Jersey to do the debugging job. Uh, subsequently, uh, when the operation was revealed in the newspapers and on television, the uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics has denied that they had any information about this operation, that we did it on our own. And that's just plain not true. Could you have done it on your own? Could you and your partner just have gotten up? You took equipment with you, I presume. We took equipment, right. You took federal property. Could you have just we gotten up on your own and flown? I suppose you flew to New York <laughs> and down to New Jersey to do this just on a whim? Or? Uh, it's incredible for anybody to believe that. Uh, I didn't know Robert Vesco. Uh, I didn't have any connections that knew him. And uh, evidently, the Drug Enforcement Administration knew Robert Vesco and had some reason to do favors for him. But I think it's... Uh, ridiculous to suggest that my partner and I, who were just street agents, would have connections like Robert Vesco and would just on our own fly to New York and debug his house. Uh, what was involved in, the, in debugging his house? Was it very complicated? Uh, no, I've, we were both trained in debugging countermeasure techniques as well as uh, bugging techniques. What if his house had been bugged by the phone company, though? Well, the, the problem was uh, he was under investigation by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, at that time. And if they would have been tapping his phone or if some other federal agency would have been tapping his phone at that time and two other federal agents came out and debugged his phone <laughs> and found the bug, there could have been a lot of problems. Be guilty well, of an obstruction of justice. Right. You would, in other words, uh, had, since, but since he was under investigation at the time, uh -huh. uh, there was a possibility that his phone was being tapped by the Justice Department. Right. In hindsight, there, there w certainly was that possibility, although we didn't have any... We didn't even know who Robert Vesco was at that time. You weren't reading My the partner. papers. Well, his name wasn't in the papers he, at that time. No, at oh, that time, uh, the allegations of him contributing to Nixon's campaign hadn't come out yet. Right, we were looking for either uh, bugs in the telephone or room bugs, eavesdropping devices in his office. And once we had swept out Mr. Vesco's office, we went to his home. Wait, wait, you, you swept out. Um, Could you get more detailed? I mean, 
What well, do we, you mean? How do you, do, how do you sweep out an office? Well, first of all, we do a, a very extensive physical search. It will take off. We'll look all through the office and just do a physical search. Then we have uh, uh, several receivers where we'll sweep through the receivers and see if we can detect any uh, any, any radio bugs. broadcasting thing. Right. We'll put a little beeper in a room and if we, we put our headphones on and receivers and we'll go through the uh, the various frequencies and if we can hear that beep in there we know that something is in the room naturally. Then we'll check the telephone lines and uh, do various other procedures that we do to yeah. detect bugs. Uh, now I saw a film called The Conversation and I, I, I presume you've seen myself. it. At the end uh, Hackman tears apart his room and can't find the listening device. I presumed it was in his saxophone. Uh, what it, where did you think it might have been? He absolutely devastated his, his dwelling, ripped out the, the walls and so on. I, I actually, I don't remember that part. It's, it's been a long time ago. <laughs> you, you really stumped me on that one. Uh, I don't recall. I mean, is it possible to put bugs into a room to put listening devices in where they're almost impossible to do? Well, sure. The, the Central Intelligence Agency or the FBI, one of their famous tricks will be when the house is being constructed, they'll place bugs in the walls when the house is being constructed, and the bugs will be there, you know, forever. Uh, wired bugs. Right, they'll put they'll either wired bugs or they'll uh, put, you know, bugs with uh, batteries or whatever they, you know, they're, they're doing at the time or they wire the house for sound. What like about the, the old, Like the old FBI office that we were housed in, in DEA. Mm -hmm. the, every wall and every, every office in uh, the office that we took over from the FBI after they moved downtown to Wilshire, had spike mics in it built into the uh, sure. into the, uh, the structure. Yeah, that was the reason built, why uh, the FBI director had to leave Los Angeles because they found out he was bugging the agents' conversations and recording his own conversations. Well, the local FBI director in Los Angeles had to leave Los Angeles because it was discovered that he was eavesdropping on his own agents. That was one of the things. It was yeah. one of the reasons that he had to leave. As yeah. I recall, hadn't he borrowed large quantities of money from people? Right. That was one of the other right. allegations. Well, now, so here you are in the offices of Robert Vesco, who today is probably the most notorious person in the world in high finance, and the U.S. government's trying to get him extradited from Costa Rica, I believe. Did you meet him while you were there? Certain parts of the government is. Uh, uh, we met Mr. Vesco and his family and had breakfast with his wife and his sons and Mr. Vesco, and then we uh, conducted a debugging or a countermeasure operation on his home. Now, didn't you, uh, didn't you wonder uh, what kind of a man this was? He wasn't a government official. What were you doing in his home? I know you were ordered to go there by your superior, but mm -hmm. did the thought ever cross your mind that you were doing something a little extraordinary? Well, at that time, I didn't know that Robert Vesco was, in fact, Robert Vesco, the uh, financier or fugitive, fugitive now. Uh, and uh, so I didn't have any, uh, any suspicions raised in my mind, although... I thought possibly he's a government official or a DEA official or uh, you just assumed. I didn't know I was just I was ordered to go to uh, New York conduct a debugging operation that was my job that's what I was trained for and I did it and and just uh, you simple. just assumed that therefore since you had been ordered to do it that there was a legal basis for you doing it right just on every other operation as a federal agent whether it be undercover or surveillance I figured that was part of my duties and uh, I did. Okay, and you, uh, you d did you find any uh, eavesdropping devices in his offices? No, I did not. Uh, did he tell you that he thought there might be? In other words, had he requested that this be done, or had it been done as a favor to him by somebody just as a gift? Well, that's a question that uh, I've asked myself on many occasions, especially uh, during hearings on that very same matter. Uh, I believe now that, uh, especially in view of information that's come out in the newspapers, it probably uh, was just a matter of influence peddling. The uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics was doing Mr. Vesco favors, and in return, the Nixon administration was getting two hundred thousand dollars in cash and little black satchels. Well, he contributed to the uh, election campaign. Right, he was uh, indicted with uh, Mr. Stans and Mr. Mitchell, and uh, also uh, uh, an investigation uh, by DEA, incidentally, of, of Mr. Uh, Vesco smuggling two hundred. Uh, I think $200 million worth of heroin in the United States. Really? $200 million worth of heroin? Into the United States. Vesco is supposed to have smuggled? Mr. Vesco was supposed to be the money man behind the operation. Yeah, it was. And Jerry has, uh, I think, some of the particulars on the investigation. Yeah, I'd like to hear about that. Well, there was a, an informant by the name of, of uh, whose name is common knowledge uh, uh, at this point, because he's already testified for the Senate subcommittee, Frank Piroff, 
was uh, an informant, and uh, he was what kind of what you call a double agent. Uh, when the heat was on, he was a snitch. When the heat was off, uh, he was a was a smuggler. And uh, he's been around for a long time. And uh, he got involved uh, with a, an individual by the name of uh, Conrad Bruchard, who is, you know, been noted to be possibly the French connection. Uh, Conrad Bouchard was in uh, Montreal, but Frank Kuroff met him, uh, I believe it was in Rome, at which time uh, Conrad Bouchard uh, and Kuroff engaged in a conversation. And uh, uh, I believe, if my memory serves me uh, correctly, Bouchard advised Kuroff that he was in financial trouble on a major counterfeiting scam, and he didn't get all his bread out, and he wanted to put, put together a dope deal and would Piroff help him, because Piroff is a pilot, jet pilot. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Piroff, uh, he agrees maybe to put it together. And he ultimately comes to uh, US Customs. It was just prior to the merger of, DE, of Customs with uh, BND, BD, BNDD, which ultimately gives rise to DEA. So Piroff has a control agent. And he says, look, I got this you know, $200 million worth of heroin deal. And so they're really hot for it. So in the meantime, Piroff gets... Oh, wait a second. Piroff goes to the U.S. Customs because he knows a U.S. Customs agent. Is that it? No, no, no. He's, like I said, he was a, he's a smuggler and a snitch. He, yeah. he kind of vacillates, oh, depending on his need. And he felt that uh, he could probably make a lot of money on this deal and maybe cool off his tail a little bit. By informing. By informing on I Conrad see. Bouchard. So he goes to a U.S. Customs agent right. to inform on Bouchard that Bouchard is talking about a major dope smuggling. Deal. Right. And Piroff had the foresight to realize that possibly this thing was so big that the feds might back off of it. So Bouchard had some tape recordings of his conversations with Conrad Bouchard. Piroff had com yeah. tape conversation with Conrad Bouchard. Uh, during the course of one of these conversations, uh, the name Robert Vesco and Norman LeBlanc were mentioned mm -hmm. as the money people. Norman LeBlanc is uh, is Vesco's right-hand man. Now, so in other words, Bouchard, in speaking to Piroff and trying to get him involved, Piroff being a jet <coughs> pilot right. and a double agent, right. police agent and criminal right. uh, type, let's say, mentions the names of Robert Vesco and right. LeBlanc as the financial backers. Right. However, this. Conrad Bouchard, uh, it, it's rumored, now I, I've never seen it, but I was told that it was in an affidavit that Conrad Bouchard had told authorities that the only reason the name Vesco and LeBlanc's name were dropped was to assure Piroff that money was there and Vesco's name and LeBlanc's name were in the headlines and Piroff would naturally believe that this was the type of money that was behind it. So Bouchard said that he was faking it, in other words. He was name dropping. I've, I've heard that. Now, I don't know whether in fact that's true or not. Bouchard now is doing life imprisonment in, uh, in Canada and uh, Piroff is hiding out someplace. And Robert Vesco was never really investigated. Well, let me, uh, it, the story goes a little bit further. No, not only was, were Borges and I sent back to debug the office of Vesco, but also this, uh, quashing the investigation we were talking about. I think it's put uh, probably most appropriately in the words of, the, of Senator Jackson's committee, who concluded their report a few months ago. And they concluded that DEA significantly uh, contributed to the failure of their own investigation. In layman's terms, I think they just covered up the investigation of Vesco dealing in heroin. Now wait, the DEA, just to remind our viewers, is the Drug Enforcement Agency. Right, the Drug Enforcement Administration, Administration. or the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Yes, now they had commenced an investigation of Robert Vesco, the notorious international financier who is presently a fugitive from U.S. law. Right. Uh, because word had come up that he possibly was the financier of a $200 million heroin import into the United States. But when they began to investigate this, the investigation was effectively covered up by themselves, by the agency itself. I think you uh, misconstrued uh, just out of sequence. Oh. The investigation was initiated by Frank Puroff's uh, contributing information in regard to the 200 pounds oh, of heroin. And as the investigation was initiated on the fact of such a large quantity, the investigation was going great. And then Robert Vesco's name comes into the picture. And then they, DEA begins to drag their feet. Now, DEA claims that they didn't have any information prior to the creation of DEA in July of 73.
They said they didn't know about it until after, after the merger. They said they had no knowledge prior to the merger of this situation. And uh, there is a report in existence, supposedly, uh, referring to Robert Vesco and a few other infamous criminal figures in, the, in Montreal, which I cannot attest to. I can only recall being uh, or hearing somebody discuss Vesco's name and Richard's name and a couple other uh, individuals. And I was asked whether I could specifically say, you know, under oath, that I physically saw a report prior to July of 73. I could not. I see. Now, when Vesco's name comes into the investigation, based on the uh, information given by this double agent informant, mm -hmm. the DEA starts to drag its feet. It eventually drops the investigation, and Senator Jackson's committee, in effect, accuses the DEA of having performed a cover-up. Vesco gave two hundred thousand dollars to the Republican National what campaign to re reelect re committee to, committee to reelect the president. 200, At least two hundred thousand uh, dollars. Jerry, coincidentally, you were you met President Nixon in the days before he became the ex-president. Yes, I did. Uh, what was that occasion? I was uh, I was instructed, ironically, by the same individual who instructed Pat to respond to Vesco's office and debug it. Uh, the deputy regional director called me into his office and said, uh, how would you like to go to the White House? And I said, I'd love it. And he said, okay, uh, you're going to leave um, such and such a time and you're going to go back there and partake in a drug abuse conference for uh, national athletes, uh, professional athletes uh, of the United States, baseball, football, hockey, and uh, was this, uh, did you consider this to be a reward for good service? To this day, I don't know what it was. It seems strange because I was a new agent. I'd only been an agent like three months. And here they're sending me back to the White House. And, uh, but I didn't question it because I was quite excited about going back. And uh, the agents that I were with uh, were, well, they had a name. They were called the Nairobi Trio. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, for infamous or famous endeavors as federal agents in the city of New York. The three of them, uh, it was kind of like a, uh, the Three Stooges routine. Oh, they I were see. quite uh, comical and notorious for their antics during... Uh, they weren't African? No. They just called them, for some reason, I never really questioned why they called them the Nairobi Trio, but uh, they were quite a group. So you, uh, <coughs> Jerry, the new agent, right. and the Niro Nairobi Trio, who are old agents, I suppose, Right are told by the same uh, boss in the Drug Enforcement Agency. Uh, no, I was told by my deputy director. They were from, uh, from the Miami office, oh, and they had made <coughs> previous trips to the White House for uh, certain conferences uh, that Nixon had had in the past. And when we get back there, uh, what the program was was to let uh, professional athletes see what a federal narcotics agent looked like, how he talked, how he responded, you know, what his bag was undercover, and, uh, and uh, also there was an informant there who had been at the White House uh, two previous times himself, uh, who was an informer who was not working off of beef. There was no pressure on him to be a snitch. He was just a professional informant, didn't have the qualifications to become an agent. This man was debriefed in the White House by the then regional director of the Miami office in front of these professional athletes to let them see. Was President Nixon present? Yes, he was. In other words, the President of the United States had a meeting in the White House during which a, a narcotics informer right. was debriefed, was questioned right. by the head of my Miami office of the right. Drug Enforcement Agency in the presence of professional athletes right. so they could see what it was like. Right. It's a now, rather strange to, situation to envision. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, one thing that interested me, I was told by the regional director that this particular informant carried a gun, had an agent's manual, and was treated just like an agent, which is in complete violation of administrative uh, rules and regulations. And uh, he's now in prison, doing 14 years for, I believe, it's an assault with a deadly weapon or attempted murder in, in New York City. Well, I mean, uh, was this common practice on the part of ex-President Nixon? Did he like things like that? Why did he call it together? Well, I, uh, President Nixon was really, uh, to me, apparently really into uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration. There was something, some underlying motive for being there. And I noticed when I was isolated with the President 
in a room. There was just myself and I believe four other agents and uh, Pat Nixon that uh, and uh, and the current direct and the past director John Ingersoll. John Ingersoll was not spoken to. He was a Johnson appointee. President Nixon obviously uh, ignored him completely, and the supposed replacement for uh, Ingersoll, Miles Ambrose, was present in the White House. And Ingersoll himself told me, as I rode back to the to headquarters with him, that he didn't figure he was long for his position. Mm -hmm. And here I am, just a GS-7, and he's telling me this. Well, I think uh, it might be of interest to our viewers to see a photograph that was taken at the time of yourself uh, with President Nixon. It's a rather uh, interesting photo. I've never seen one quite like it. And you brought it into the studio. Uh, I, in the photo that we're going to see, there are also a number of other uh, people besides yourself and the president. Uh, could you describe, let's say, uh, going from the president's left, I see you're the second on his left, is that right? That's correct. The individual to his immediate uh, left is Ben Tyson, former regional director of the Miami office in Miami, Florida. And what about the individual on his right? On his right is the former director of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, John Ingersoll. Uh, can we move over a little bit so we can see uh, Jerry a little more clearly? There, you're wearing a leather jacket? Or? Yeah, the only reason I was dressed the way I was is that the airlines lost all my clothes the day I was supposed to be at the White House. They sent them to Hawaii instead of D.C. I don't know if that was an omen or what. <laughs> are, are the other people in the shot uh, all uh, narcotics uh, officers or what? Aside from the director and the president and the regional director, Everybody else is street agents. I was a, of the lowest grade there. I was a GS-7. Uh, the man to my, uh, to my right, Benjamin Tyson, was a GS-15. The director himself was a GS-18. Uh, George Allen, right next to the director, uh, he was a GS-13. He's a member of the Nairobi Trio. It was George Allen and Carlo Baccio to my, to my left. It was slightly out of the picture. Yeah, could we see uh, more to uh, Jerry's left? And the individual next to Carlo was uh, Pete Scroca, who was uh, also a group supervisor in Miami. Uh, you the individual right to the left of George Allen there yeah. is uh, Frankie Tomello, who was shot and killed uh, about a year and a half ago in New York City. That's, uh, he's got a beard, is that him? No, that's George Allen. The guy just to the left of, uh, of George is Frankie Tomello. I see. I see. Now, I, I, I understand that Mr. Tyson, I believe it is, Mm -hmm. uh, was involved in some kind of uh, public affair recently. I <laughs> yeah, I guess you might call it a public affair. It, uh, I was told uh, back in Washington, D.C., that uh, he streaked through one of the major hotels there in Miami. Uh, is that uh, sometimes happened to officials of the Drug Enforcement Agency? Is that common practice <laughs> of major administrators? <laughs> they can, but we can't. <laughs> I think he was demoted over there, wasn't he? Yeah, he was ultimately demoted, I believe. I don't know if they would cop out to initially demoting him uh, for that. The basic problem of being an idealistic person, a person who believes in law and order and in, uh, is against the use of uh, dangerous and, you know, well, substances that hurt people or get them on a dependency uh, thing, that got you into first law enforcement and then into to, uh, the drug uh, enforcement agency eventually began to be contradicted by the things that you observed there and the situations you found yourselves in and led to your resignation. And I would like to know just what it was, what, what <coughs> did this? This is a tremendous thing to do in your life, to have the aiming in a direction, working hard for it, and then suddenly find you can't do it. Pat, what, what was it with you? It was, needless to say, it was a great disappointment to, to me and to Jerry, I'm sure, also. But I think one of the first things that, uh, that I realized that I was in the wrong place, the wrong business, is when I, I think I just left enforcement, I'd gone into intelligence, and um, the assistant regional director and several other senior agents uh, were discussing with me and with other agents the, uh, their plans to form a, an extra group in the office. And uh, this would be com uh, composed of myself and uh, another agent that had electronics background and a couple of agents that had some uh, background in self-defense and in firearms training. And the plan was to uh, assassinate uh, certain uh, large drug smugglers in Mexico. Wait, wait, I want to get this very clear. All right. 
your supervisor in your office? Well, not my supervisor and his supervisor, who was also one of my other supervisors Assistant. in the chain of command. Assistant, Assistant Regional Director and a group supervisor. Group yeah. supervisor is one step removed. The Assistant Regional Director of the Drug Enforcement Agency Los Angeles office right. Right, and a regional supervisor right. approached you and other street agents. Well, we were, I think, sitting around discussing yeah. uh, law enforcement okay. matters, and this yeah. subject came up. And they proposed that you set up an assassination team for killing people who they felt were major drug importers or dealers in Mexico. Right. Well, that's basically correct. They didn't suggest that we set it up. They were going to set it up, and uh, the certain people that were there, certain little group of people that were there, were the people that they wanted to be in that group. And they discussed that we would, uh, they identified a couple of people that we had identified in the intelligence unit as being major suppliers of heroin uh, to California and other states. And they proposed that we uh, uh, exterminate them, to murder them. Did you feel that this was uh, some kind of a thing on their part, that these two individuals, just it was their own personal idea, or that they had gotten orders to do this from up above? And naturally, I, I can't say with cert any certainty, but I, I felt that it was just a policy of not only the Bureau of Narcotics, but possibly the government. And, you know, late revelations obviously show that maybe the may or probably is the situation. But at that time, I felt, well, it's, maybe that's the way the Bureau feels about it, and these people are just carrying out their orders. And uh, I was just sh shocked, and I didn't want to be a part of anything like that. What did you do about it? Was there anybody you could go to and say, hey, wait a minute, we're planning to set up these Brazilian-type, you know, death squads or what? Well, these people were my supervisors. There was nobody to go to. Could you go to, to Washington? Could you go to the head of the agency? Well, I didn't know if, if it was just a general policy and that was carried out in different regions. I didn't know. You kind of have to understand your situation. When, you, when you're confronted with that type of idea, that type of proposal, that you don't really ask any questions beyond this, those people who have suggested that you fulfill this request. Uh, and I know what Pat's position uh, was, and the individual who is suggesting this isn't a guy that you would go behind his back uh, and say, hey, what about Mr. So-and-so? Uh, this is what he wants me to do because, uh, and again, this is uh, my opinion, and I'm sure it's Pat's. You know, if he did, he would end up in the, in the street with a bullet in his head. Oh, wait a minute. Let me get this very, very clear. You felt that this official of the Drug Enforcement Agency that had you attempted to bring to the attention of higher officials or let's say the Attorney General's office the idea that he had proposed the establishment of a murder group mm -hmm. to go kill foreign nationals who, they, who you felt were drug dealers that had you gone to the U.S. Attorney General's office that this individual might have seen to it that you were killed? I don't, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind to that fact. Not either. I mean, these, these people were our supervisors. We were new agents, and uh, there was a feeling of, well, get along. I want to uh, enhance my career, not necessarily to assassinate people, but I, but I didn't want to create waves. When I heard something like this, I was just shocked, and I wanted nothing to do with it. So what did you do? I talked to a couple of agents that, I, that were in this particular group or going to be in this group and uh, that I felt I could speak to, and I said, I don't want any part of this. You know, I'm going to stay in intelligence, and I don't want any part of it. I don't want to hear about it. And uh, I stayed in intelligence. I don't know if they transmit. I presume they transmitted that message to uh, the assistant regional director or other people. Do you know if the group was subsequently formed and did it do any of these things? Well, right after that, they had formed this group, and there was a new regional director that came into Los Angeles, and that group did not come into existence officially. And as far as assassinating anybody, I don't know if that happened. I just not in a position to know. But you do know that I didn't take you were approached to be part of such a group? Most definitely. Uh, this is, I've never heard of this before and I've never seen it in the press. I think this is really quite an unusual piece of information. Now, is that what led you to resign from the department? That's just one thing that did. I, I think uh, one of the other major things that made me resign is being used by my government, my, the agency in particular, in the VESCO matter. That, that hurt me. You didn't think about it at the time, but later on it began bothering. When I found out it was Robert Vesco, I felt used and misused, and uh, it made me angry. Plus, I'd seen agents beat defendants, steal money from defendants, uh, lie about particular events that occurred during an investigation, perjured themselves in court. 
You had seen your fellow narcotics agents do all these things, beat people, steal sure. from them, lie about them, and so on. Sure. And these things built up in you, or what? Well, after a while, I, mean, I think people can only take so much. And like I said before, and looking back on it, I'm not particularly proud of myself for not coming forward at that time. But things just built up in me where I couldn't take it any longer. I had seen these things, uh, and I just couldn't take it. I didn't want to be part of it. I couldn't take it, so I quit. And subsequently to that, Jerry and I got together, and we've approached uh, Senator Jackson, cooperated with his committee. And now, as everyone knows, the hearings are going on. The, f the head of DEA has been forced to resign. He's fired. And the hearings, hopefully, will unveil some of this corruption. And there'll be a, a legitimate, honest organization to enforce the laws in the future. Jerry, what about yourself? What led you to resign? It was a tough decision for me uh, to resign. And uh, it still bothers me that, uh, that I did resign because I would still, let's say maybe after the cleanup, like to be a federal narcotics agent because I believed in what I attempted to do and what I did. And, and I have to join in conjunction with Pat that it, was a, it wasn't like a, a total revelation uh, of illicit activities uh, taken on by a few agents a few administrators. Uh, DEA as a whole has a purpose and has a job and there's some darn good agents and some darn good administrators but I was within a group that were bad. They were they didn't respect the laws that they enforced. I saw wiretapping of, of other supervisors of other agents uh, building dossiers on on agents leaking that information to the internal police of DEA, the Office of Inspection, because they felt maybe this particular agent was getting too close to maybe some of the illegal or illicit activities. Wait, wait, wait. Now, you felt that, I mean, it was your impression that when an agent began to get close to real dealers in narcotics, the real connections, that pressure was brought against them by the Drug Enforcement Agency? Is that it? No, not particularly. There is a few instances where as I was going to uh, be introduced to uh, major members of the La Cosa Nostra uh, by a reliable, credible informant, and I had written and written report after report after report, which was designa designated Operation Clipper uh, to infiltrate organized crime, and this guy could introduce me to everybody in the organized crime field. I mean, major, major uh, figures. This was covered up, and I had spent five years developing this informant, and at the last moment, it just fell apart. They said they just didn't want to use him. I was not never given a reason why. And out of frustration, I turned him over to a, a very excellent agent uh, here in Los Angeles, FBI agent, who utilized him. And that was one of the other things that turned me against uh, DEA and thinking about res resigning. The last thing that really turned my stomach is I was shot at uh, in front of the U.S. courthouse and subsequent to being shot at by parties or parties unknown to me and supposedly unknown to the Drug Enforcement Administration, subsequent to that shooting, I was called in the office uh, of the Deputy Regional Director, Irv Swank, who called me Tom, and my name is Jerry, and advised me that I was being put on limited duty and that uh, I was to have my gun, my badge, my credentials, turned into him immediately. And I asked him, am I being fired? And he says, no, we're just putting you on limited duty. And also, my, my wife had been threatened uh, by an unknown person. Uh, her life had been threatened. Uh, they said they were going to bomb the house. This was over the telephone. Bomb the house, kill the kids, kill her, kill me. If that she was after you turned over this informant to the FBI agent? Yeah. So you feel that they try to stop you from developing contacts with La Cosa Nostra, and when you turned it over to the FBI agent, you were fired at, your wife was threatened over the phone, and you were taken off of active duty. Right, but I don't think that the informant situation is directly tied. It might be. I don't know. You were fired at. Your wife was threatened over the phone. All these things happened. What, what else was involved in your decision to resign from the Drug Enforcement Agency? The final decision was a mismanagement of a major investigation and the failure of, of a assistant regional director 
to heed my suggestions and the end result was a Los Angeles police officer, a narcotics officer, was shot and killed in a hotel room in Holiday Inn where I was present. And the reason that, you know, it's, it's hindsight, but if this assistant regional director would have pursued the investigation as I felt it should have been, I don't think that that situation would have resulted. And it was just another tantamount decision of bad judgment. And I just got sick of it. And looking back, I could see all the, the little incidents that this small group, once again, of unconscientious agents were partaking in that just all seemed to add up. You know, here was a dead police officer. Here I was shot at. My wife was threatened. In the meantime, these guys are wheeling and dealing in their little illegal activities and forgotten what they were originally hired for. And it seemed like the values uh, within the Los Angeles office, at least, were of questionable nature. And I just, I figured if I was going to get blown up, I wanted to be blown up around guys that I trusted, guys that I believed that maintained the same values that I did. And I just didn't figure it was worth it. So I left something I really dearly cared for because of a few people within that agency. Now, both of you resigned. How did, did you know each other while you were in the agency? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. uh, did you uh, <coughs> resign at about the same time? Was there any connection between your resignations? No. When Pat resigned. Get, when did you get together? Well, we didn't get together. Actually, Pat resigned almost, uh, what, nine months or a year before I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were told after Pat resigned uh, that we were not allowed to speak to Pat Saunders at all. Specifically, do not talk to Pat Saunders. And that was the regional director, Frank Pappas, that told us we couldn't talk to him. So I, I accepted the, you know, his word or his command. And, and finally, all my revelations were beginning to, to come to a head. I left the Bureau and uh, began to seek other employment with utter and, and unbelievable futility. And finally, Pat and I got together and said, do you think the reason that they're, you know, the Bureau's keeping us down is because we know too much and they just want to constantly keep us down and, and have other things on our mind besides, you know, maybe revealing what we know? And we kind of agreed, yeah, that's, that's possibly it. And like, I was number one on the Huntington Beach Police Department's list. And I was called down there for a final interview. And they put me on a polygraph. And they started asking me all the questions about the Bureau, and which I refused to answer to a greater or lesser degree because I was under obligation to the United States Senate. And they said, well, you did real good on the polygraph test. We'll call you. When I got home, there was a letter dated two days prior to the polygraph saying that I'd been rejected. That's incredible. So Pat has faced the same problems gaining employment as I have. And we felt as though that we're highly qualified and uh, sophisticated investigators with uh, very sophisticated techniques and, and a lot of uh, informant contacts and a tremendous amount of criminal knowledge. So at which time we have formed a private investigative agency, which we uh, provide a service for anybody in need of our service. What do you call yourself? It's uh, Pat Saunders and Associates is the license, and it's uh, Laveroni and Saunders Investigative Service. So you are now offering your services as, uh, in effect, private investigators. That's right. correct. What are you doing, or let's put it this way. I know what you're doing. You're also working on this book, which is a very important book. What do you think the people of the United States should ask their elected representatives to do to get proper drug enforcement? I mean, you know about it, you know the problems of it. What can we do to rectify the situation? I think they should increase the training academy to not to 10 weeks, but to the amount of time that it takes for an agent to, be, to feel comfortable in enforcing the federal laws. I think the overall system of DEA needs to be looked at. I think there's, there's people in upper, upper echelon positions within the Drug Enforcement Administration that are not properly qualified to delegate authority, to delegate enforcement rules and regulations. I feel as though that the uh, qualifications for an agent should be as, as strict as that as it is for an FBI agent. The FBI does, like any other agency, have some internal problems, but by God, if you foul up in the FBI and there's any inclination at all that you may be stealing this or doing this illegally, you're going out the door. So you think higher standards, better training, and let's hope that these things will lead to a situation where the problems that led both of you to resign and the cover-up of things can no longer exist.
I want to thank you both very, very much for being with us. Who is the American connection? A question which is still unanswered, but at least we've gotten a little idea of some of the problems involved in stopping the narcotics traffic in the United States. Ooh.